In the first Jesus part one politics I shared with you last week, I shared with you nothing divides us like politics, and it all comes through what? Fear. And that's Satan's trap. He wants to get you and I to fear, and, and, and fear is what divides us. And whenever you look at politics, and, and I, I, I encourage people to be in politics. I want great people in politics. I'm not against politics. And it's not my goal today to change your political persuasion. It's not my goal today to change how you vote or when you vote or whatever, other than you do need to vote but, or, or, or any of your stance. My goal today is to get you to think the way Christ thinks about the issue of politics. You see, whenever you look at politics, and every politician does it because it's the only way they can gain an office, whether it's a local level, regional, or national level, and that is peddling fear. You know, it's kind of like, well, we're gonna, they're going to take your guns. Give me 20. Give me 25. Give me 50. Well, you know, they're going to take uh, you know, your tuition for college. Well, give me 20. Give me 50. Give me 100. And so politics constantly peddles fear and the reason it peddles fear it's not their fault really the reason they peddle fear is because we buy into it the reason they peddle fear is because we support it financially and it's the way they survive and the big thing I hit last week was talking about how nothing divides us like politics and politics operates through fear and then the other piece of that is that Jesus prayed for two things really in John 17 I shared with you last week number one he prayed that uh, for you and I, that we would be protected. But number two, it was different than a prayer. It was a prayer request. And could you imagine being in a prayer circle with Jesus and everybody's taking requests and Jesus says, oh, I, I have a request. I mean, that'd really get your attention, wouldn't it, if Jesus had made a prayer request. And what was his prayer request? Now, you got to think about this. This is the final hours of his life in John 17. It's called the priestly prayer. It's his final prayer before he's taken in uh, to, uh, to, to be persecuted. And in this, in this prayer, the number one thing he said or this request was that we would stay unified. That we, his disciples, and all the disciples following them would stay in unity. He said that they would they may all be one as we are one. And the only way the enemy can tear your family apart is through division. And division always begins and is rooted in disunity. And the only way he can tear our church apart, the only way he can tear your, your business apart, or anything like that, is through disunity. And that's the way the enemy has set all of this up for. Now, the end thing that he is most concerned about is what? Is our unity. And what I want to challenge you with, it's time to protect your unity. So is the slide thing working, or do we know? It is? Okay, we're good. Pray. Give a big hand. Slide thing's working. I'm going to be hitting. We need a whole new sound system. We need new technical support. And it's probably going to be somewhere around 80 grand. But the good news is you have the money, so don't worry about it. Is anybody ready to just to overhaul this 12-year-old junk? I'm sick of it. I mean, they, and in their defense, they came in and tested it yesterday. It worked fine. But it's 12, 13 years old. Amen? But God has better than that for you and I. So let's go to the second slide. So here's what I want to ask you. Are we willing to put our faith filter ahead of our political filter? Woo! See, that's what God's asking us. It's not how you vote, when you vote, who you vote. No, are we willing to put what our faith filter, our faith, how we were raised in Christ, our faith, what Jesus writes about and what his words are about. Are we willing to put our faith filter ahead of what? Our political filter. Now, let's go to the next slide because this is pretty cool, and I want to I hit this with you. Here's what I shared with you last week that we do what? We are to what? Dis even if we disagree politically, we're to do what? Love unconditionally and do what? Pray for unity. Now, just keep it there for a minute. Remember, I challenged you last week. Did anybody find anyone that has a different political view than you than talk to them, right? 
Some of you did. And, and I bet you learned some things. I did that years ago uh, where there was a political campaign just tearing the body of Christ apart. And, and, and whenever I sat down with some people I love and respect who had a different political view than mine, I really began to understand why they had their view. Now, here in a minute, I'm going to give you a real simple template to help you know when, what you need to understand and how, what to know and how to operate moving forward. But see, the key is when we disagree politically, that if I put that, my political view, my political stance before my Jesus filter, right, I'm going to hurt myself or hurt someone else. I'm not going to have the influence I need, and I'm really not going to get the results I need. And what's, what we're supposed to do, what? Love unconditionally. Well, you know, I love you, but, you know, uh, you know that's, you're a little crazy. You're a little far left. You're a little far right. You're this. You're that. And what happens is then that's conditions. So if I truly love you unconditionally, as the Word says, then I'm going to love you under, under condition, any condition, under any circumstance. And then what is it? The power is prayer for unity. And that's what we need to be praying for, prayer for unity. Let's go to the next slide. Here's the key. We all are in this situation where everyone wanted, you know, everyone, when Jesus was on the earth, what? Everyone wanted him to be on their side. What happened? The Pharisees wanted him to be on their side. They tried to trick him. The Sadducees tried to trick him. You know, the priests in the temple tried to trick him. Everybody wanted to find a way to get Jesus on their side. And, and it's the same way today politically. You, you could, we, what, it is, what it is is Jesus, they, we want him on our side, what? And, and what you do when you begin to filter your words, I want you to understand it's so easy to make Jesus so red. I could come up here anytime and put a message together and, and, and support the, 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 the Republican Party just right down the line. And then we also say, well, Jesus, he's so blue. I could do the same thing with the Democratic Party. I could come up here and, and, and I could put a message together and make you believe, man, that's the way you should vote. That's the way you should go. The same thing. But it's amazing how often Jesus agrees with you when you put your political view first and you take his words and manipulate them to support your agenda. Ooh. And we will allow ourselves to take his words and other words of great men and women in the Bible and shape them around the filter of our political view. We look at it as a way to what? To, to, to get people convinced to feel what we feel, to believe what we believe, and to do what we want them to do. But see, that's a trick from the enemy. What you got to do is trust God, love people, and influence people by listening to them and understanding them. Listen, you don't know what you don't know. There's things I believed 10 years ago I don't believe now, even scripturally, that I had to learn and grow. There's things in politics and issues and policies that I believed in, and I'm like, man, that didn't work out. I don't believe that anymore. You should never allow your political point of view to break a relationship in your life. Oh, you just quiet and Holy Ghost there. A... We should never allow our political point of view to destroy any relationship we have. Is that what Jesus did? Did Jesus minister to the Pharisees? Did Jesus minister to the Sadducees? Did Jesus minister to the very people who were crucified him while he's hanging on the cross? Says, what, Father, forgive them for they know what, not what they do. Yeah, but they want this or they want that or we want this or we want that. Wait, wait, wait a minute, where's that unconditional love? So I had to really gear myself back a number of years ago because I'm very opinionated, as you could tell. And obviously, I think I'm right 99.9.9% .9 .9 of the time until Stephanie puts the pen in there, and I realize I'm about 70% of the time I'm correct. But, but what I want you to realize, guys, it's easy to make, it's easy to make Jesus red. It's easy to make Jesus blue. It's easy to make Jesus an independent. There's not a political party out there today that doesn't have, quote, Jesus in the center through their filter of what they want. 
right? It's kind of like, I love you if. Well, that's not unconditional love. And what we got to watch as the church to keep our unity is to always put Jesus, our relationship with him, that filter ahead of our political filter. Can you say amen this morning? Amen. Listen, I love this quote. Jesus didn't come to take sides. Jesus did what? He came to take over. That's what he came to do. He didn't come to take sides. He came to take over. And if you are naive enough to think that Jesus and his teachings will not have any conflict with your political point of view, your political party, or whatever, then you're, you're mistaken. Because let me tell you something, there's no political party that lines up 100% with Jesus and his views. There's, there's no preacher. We think we do, we try to, but we still even line up with Jesus according to a lot of our, our filters as a child. How I was raised, what I believe, what I experienced, what I experienced in church, what I didn't experience in church, we are operating by filters. And if we don't come to the place, guys, to where we can take a pause, and go, and just listen. I don't mean just listen like, yeah, okay, I, I do that, Pastor. No, I'm not talking about that. Well, you know, I, I do that all the time. No, you don't talk, but you're not listening. Listening is when I'm really trying to understand where you're coming from. And I tell you right now, it doesn't matter if it's in business, it doesn't matter if it's raising your children or in a political conversation, if you're trying to just wait till they get done doing this so you can give what you think is important, you're never going to influence or win anyone. It's up to you and I to do it the Jesus way and to operate the way he wants us to do. So today I want to give you a very simple template, and that's why I wanted to do it like this, different than the way I normally preach, of course. I want to do it, why? Because we need to understand where agreement and diverse opinions begin and end. Because it's important for us to understand that when we get to the place where we understand where these take place, how can I understand where agreement ends if I never listen? How can I understand where agreement ends and diverse opinions begin? Here's the thing you got to realize, guys. When, when we came to this city, before we did, one of the key things God said, Bethel would be a church of the Gentiles. And I questioned him about that. Like, I thought we were engrafted into the vine. And all. He said, well, you are. He said, but you're going to be a church that's made up of all different races and kinds of people and people from different backgrounds. And so ages and economic situations, educational situations, races and all that stuff, even people coming in from Catholic, from Baptist, from Pentecostal, from nothing, from atheism and agnostics, people coming in that are up and out and down and out and in between and out, and all these people are going to make up your church. It's really going to look like being at a, a UK football game in the stadium and just look around, and it's going to look very similar to that. And, and I was cool with that. I didn't know how it would happen. I didn't put a sign up and say, hey, we're a church of the Gentiles. We're a multicultural, multigenerational church. And I've even had preachers ask me that are either all black or all white, how can we be multicultural? And I said, I can't tell you how. I don't know. There's no trick to it. It's just being who God called you to be and loving people and loving one another and seeing everybody equal and one as you. It's real easy. It's not real hard to do. One of the things I hated when I was in a, a seminary was for a couple years was a ministerial, high-level ministerial uh, program in a wonderful university and I was in an evangelism class, and they were teaching us about homogeneous units. You know what that is? That's, you know, white people of a certain age and socioeconomic background, black people at a certain age and socioeconomic background and educational background, Asian people, you know, brown people, all these different people. And you had to decide if you're going to build a true church, you had to pick the people you wanted to market to. You had to, and this is taught in your seminary. It was at least then in your seminaries. I, I'm sure it probably still is. And, and I got so mad, Miss Gwen, in that class. I didn't even understand it. I'm a little Nazarene boy. And I got ticked off. And I looked at somebody beside me. And like, you better be quiet. I said, I don't care. This is stupid. Why am I going to come to a college to learn how to eliminate 80% of the people I'm supposed to reach? <laughs> 
But what I want you to understand is that's their understanding at that time. That's where they were. And that's what I want to encourage you with today. What you are so adamant and ready to fight over today, you may totally change your mind in three years about it. But God's kingdom will be the same. Those relationships will be gone. And you'll be starting over with new friends and new people to influence. So today I want to give you a very simple template of how to do this. And the first piece of this, the first component you and I as Christians have to live by is the law of Christ. Now where did the law of Christ come from? Well, this is something that Paul gave us in his writings in 1 Corinthians, and he wrote it in two different places. It's only really mentioned in a couple different places, and he wrote about it. But you've got to realize where it's coming from. I mean, Paul was Saul, right? Paul was a Christian hater. He was having Christians stoned. He was having uh, husbands and wives in prison. He was taking their wealth, the, scattering them all over the place. And so he was a Christian hater, a Jesus hater. Not only that, you know, he was uh, educated by Gamaliel. He was one of the most educated Pharisees from the top Pharisaical school that was in the world at the time in Ephesus. And not only that, he was a Roman citizen. He had it all. He had the political power. His father was a strong political financial dude in Ephesus in the shipping community, kind of like California would be today on one of the coasts there. And so Paul, at that time, Saul was an up-and-coming star. He could have been a political star. He could have been a religious star. He was actually trained for both. And when he comes, he had all this strong point of view. And he was so set in this Jesus as this false God, and he's tearing God's kingdom apart. And he, he hated Jesus. He hated everything about him. Why? Simply because he didn't understand. Huh. There was a time in my life I didn't understand Jesus. I had given my life to the Lord when I was in second grade for a short period of time, and then that didn't last long. I know it's hard to believe, but it didn't. And I never came back to Christ until years later after going through addiction and all kinds of stuff. Until I was 21, I gave my life to Christ. But right before that, about a two-year period before that, I was so miserable, I was ready to die because I would try to quit the drugs. I'd try to stop cursing. I'd try to stop running around. All this stuff, what, to clean myself up because... I thought, man, if I really do this, I want to do it forever, right? And I want to be all in, and I know I'm so weak, i got to get myself ready. And somewhere along the way, I'd break my commitment. Somewhere along the way, I'd blow it to the point I'd just given up. Like, I, I, I can't do this. So I just got to the end to where it wasn't worth living anymore, and I knew it's getting to a dangerous place in my life. I was going to kill myself or someone else through being an idiot. And what did I do? I had to just surrender. And go to a little Nazarene church with my mom on a Sunday night. You've heard the story. 17 adults there. And our pastor Art preaching the house down. But I don't remember what he preached. I was ready to get saved. And came up that little green aisle, that little aisle on that wood floor, a little lime green carpet runner to a little hard wooden altar and gave my life to Christ. And when I got up, it was like everything was beautiful and bright. And these desires had left. And, and all these things happened. It was totally different than what I understood. I understood it to be you have to be like this person or you have to be like that person or you have to do it this way or the way that church does it. I, I, I didn't understand the personal relationship aspect. I didn't know Jesus. Now, here's what's sad. There's a lot of people saved, going to heaven, still don't know Jesus very well. You could always tell someone that knows Jesus pretty well by the way not the right things and wrong things we think they do, but how they treat people, right? Because we seem to treat people in the church service and church facilities and properties one way. We treat them a little different when they're a server and our food's late another way, right? We treat them a little different when we're trying to cut a deal with them to buy a car. We, we, we treat them a little different, you know, when they didn't get along with someone we love. We definitely treat them different if they don't vote the way we vote. But is that Jesus' way? So if in any of those areas I'm lacking, that means I need maturity. What's maturity? It's knowing something you didn't know. You ever been like me, a little older, so I wish I could be 18. Well, I don't wish I'd be 18, but I used to say it maybe when I was 35. Or I wish I could be 18 and know what I know now. Right? 
one honest person raised her hand over here. We've all said it in different stages. I'd like to be 20 again and know what I know now. What are you saying? I'm more mature now. I've had some experiences, good and bad, and I'm at a different place with what? A different understanding of what's important. And if we don't take a pause, and if we don't take time to sit back and learn what the law of Christ is, and how to apply this first component to us will always be miserable every time an election comes around. Look at your neighbor and say, stop being miserable. So let's look at it here. He gives us the, the key here in just a moment, but I want to start with this. 1 Corinthians 9, 19. Paul said this. He says, though I, was, I am free and I belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone. Now, now, let's stay there a minute. He made himself a slave. Now, in that time, slavery was in every community, every city, every nation, every monarchy, slavery, people were indentured servants, and so on. Even if you were in debt, you became a slave until your debt was paid. So he was saying, he was taking this extreme measure of giving us the greatest example we could ever have of his time and era. He said, I have, no one else made me. I'm free, right? But I made myself a slave, what? To everyone. Paul would go into any culture and he would form to that culture, what? Because he wanted to win them. He wanted to win them to Christ. And Paul was saying, I'm on a mission. I've been murdering Christians. I've been imprisoning families. I've been, you know, cursing Jesus, my Lord and my Savior. I've wasted this large portion of my life. I got to get busy. You all can serve Jesus however you want. Me, I'm making myself a slave to the cause of Christ. What was this down? Go back to where we were. I'm not done with that. There you go. So, thank you. So, so I have made myself what a slave what, to everyone, every culture. Remember when he was in a temple in one place and it was false gods and stuff and he was eating certain foods and people questioned, well, Paul, why are you eating that? You can't eat that. And Paul said, come on, man. I'll become whatever I got to become to what win them. That doesn't mean you go out and commit sins and all this stuff. But what he's saying is the traditions and the things that we found out later wasn't that bad. You know, it was in the law, don't do, eat certain foods and all that. But see, he, he had gotten beyond that because it was so emphatic to him to influence and win others to his God. And to do what? To win as many as possible while he was on this planet. Okay, we can go to the next one now. Now the law of Christ, here it is, Ah. Uh, to those not having the law, I became like one not having the law. In other words, to the Gentiles, right? He said, I became a Gentile to the Gentiles. I became a Jew to the Jews. Whatever their culture, their background was, I became one of them. What? Though I am not free from the law of God, but I am under the law of Christ. Now, what he said in the previous verse, he said he's not under the law. What law? The Torah, the law that Moses brought that was in its time, you were supposed to obey that. But since Christ came, there's a new law, a new covenant, and he wants to help us understand that, and he wants us to come to the place to where we change, listen, 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 our understanding. I remember one time I backslid Paul. I'm serving God. I'd started the business. I was the biggest tither in the church by far, and I was 23 years old. And God was dealing with me to preach, and I didn't want to preach. I didn't want to be a poor preacher living out in a block house in a little by the church there, and everybody aggravating you, and a bunch of kids running around that, you know, you couldn't feed, you couldn't clothe, but you're the humble preacher. That wasn't my ideal of the kingdom. Even though mine was more a selfish reason, right? <laughs> you know, kind of like you don't get saved because you get called to be a missionary to China or something, right? And so, um, why did I start on that? <laughs> that was my understanding, right? And, and what I did, I ran from God. And one of the things that got me, you know, when I got saved, you were supposed to burn all your CDs and your music and do all that and not listen to any secular radio. 
Man, I'd, I'd listen to a song on the radio, and then I'd be Sunday morning running the altar. I mean, I bet I went twice to the altar every service for like six months. I was the most miserable person in the world because I was trying to live by all these rules that I thought I was supposed to live by that people didn't really say. They just seemed to live that way. What it was, a lot of them were living way more mature than me, and it wasn't a lot of them. It's just the way they lived at that point through their understanding. But with a lack of understanding, trying to be like people who are mature without being mature is dangerous. Because instead of imitating, you've got to realize where you really are and deal with it. Look at your neighbor and say, deal with it. And, and I ended up running from God for like eight months, totally just running from God, get back in drugs, everything, and had to repent and come back to Christ and agree to preach his gospel. And that was when I was right 23 years old. And ever since then, I started preaching his gospel when I was about 23 years and eight or nine months old to now. I'm 58, so that's a, a day or two. So why did I go through that turmoil? Why did I go through that pain? Why did I cause my family pain? Why did I cause my pastor and the church ladies who fasted to get me convicted enough to come back to God? Why did all that happen? A lack of understanding. Because I was trying to be mature when I wasn't mature. You ever get tired of people running their mouth telling you something that they kind of know something about but they really don't know and you can tell they don't totally know after you ask a few questions but they will not admit to you they really don't know. They just keep trying to sell you on it, right? That's the way you sound when you talk about politics. Seriously. I'm not nervous. You know why that's the way you sound? Because you don't know. Is the news media telling you the truth? Huh? Is, is, the, is the Republicans telling you the 100% of the truth? Are the Democrats telling you 100% of the truth? So then what do you really know? But you will fight and die over what you think you know, and you don't know. Now, I'm not trying to change what you vote and how you believe. I'm very convicted in what I believe and how I vote. And there's a purpose behind the madness. But it's a summation of all the years of my life coming to this point. But I'm going to sit here and try to slap you over the head and get you to do what I do because I might be wrong. Because I thought I wasn't before and found out I was wrong. Everybody say understanding. So we don't know, guys, what we don't know. So why don't we stop babbling on social media about stuff you don't know, quoting people you don't know. They could have been the biggest liars on the planet Earth or they got it from somebody else from somebody else that made it up. And you're putting your, listen, you're putting your influence. And listen, on the line, and even if you're 100% right, you just lost influence with 50% of the people you know. Well, should I stand for what I believe? Yeah. Should, and I'm going to tell you where that comes from in a minute. And, and, and should I talk about this in the right setting when somebody wants to hear it from you, person to person? But if you're just talking at them, they didn't hear you either. It's a conversation back and forth with unconditional love. Well, I can't believe they believe that. Oh, Lord. Well, they can't believe you believe what you believe. So what are you going to do in the church? You say, well, why is he so adamant about this? Because uh, 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 the first year of President Obama, whenever that was over, I had people, Republicans, Democrats, Independents, some weren't even saved, leave the church because they say, well, if they voted that way, I could never have them lead me in prayer. If they voted that way, this other one that the red said, if they voted that way, I could never have them lead me in a small group of prayer. The red said, I, if they voted that way, I think they did. It sounded like a social, if they voted that way, I could never have them leave it, lead me in prayer or lead me in a, a small group. And the Independents said, we don't want to be a part of this. This is crazy. And we had two or three hundred people trickle out over about three months. They didn't always get up and leave that day. But why did they leave? For their lack of understanding. Because even if you vote differently than me, if I cannot unconditionally love you just the way you are, 
then I cannot do God's will. Oh, now, preacher, now you bring you're bringing politics into the will of God. I know the will of God for my life. Since I was a child, I had a dream and a vision. And Auntie had a dream and the preacher prophesied. I, I don't really care. I'm not talking about the things you do. I had someone say, you know, a lot of times I see people in ministry, especially mistake their ministry for the will of God for their life. A ministry is something he gave you to do. And anytime you got to put something you do above people you know and love, you need to stop it. But preacher, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Right. But preacher, put God first. Exactly. Put God first, not your ministry. Put God first, not your politics. Put God first and not your opinion about anything. Or anyone. What do you mean? Well, when you put God first, you start operating by what? The law of Christ. To those not having the law, let's see, to those not having the law, what? I became like one of them not having the law, though from the law of God, but under the law of Christ. Well, what is the law of Christ? Let's go to the next one. Here it is. He says in John, Paul said this, I give you a new commandment. A new commandment I give to you. And this is what's considered the law of Christ, that you love woo, one another, whether you agree or not, as I have loved you, that you may also love one another. So we don't get to choose how we love people. Amen. You know, I love them, I just don't like them. You're a liar or you're very naive or to even say that. I, even if I catch myself saying it, I hardly ever do now, but you say it a lot, and I, I just have to stop it because it's not truth. Because I don't get to love the way I was raised and think I should love. This little word right here is a booger. A-S. You add one more letter that tells you what you are if you don't do it. The preacher cursed. That's in your own mind. You need to repent. I didn't say I didn't say a word. It's like the first three letters of assumption, right? Yeah, you assumed, right? Look at as what? Anybody know how Christ loved? How many times did he forgive? Seven times seventy, which is millions. Who did he forgive? They, somebody had taught, they gossiped about me. I'll never trust them again. You don't have to trust them, but you got to forgive them. Yes. Trust is not given, trust is earned. Yes. But forgiveness is given. Yes. So when I look through the filter of Jesus, if you have a difficult, different political view than me, and we disagree on, quote, policies and issues, that's one thing. But we got to come into unity over how we love one another. And the standard is golden. It's as Jesus loved us. Did anyone in here even deserve salvation? I know I didn't. So that means he loved me just as I was. Even if I never came to him. You got to love people just as they are, even if they never agree with you. I know it's a shock. But it's up to you to protect you. What it, when I said it's not God's will, what I said too is, what is God's will for you? The one request Jesus made in John 17, that we protect the unity. That's the will of God for you, to protect the unity in the church, to protect the unity with Christians, to protect the unity. That doesn't mean you don't tell truth and teach truth, and, but you've got to do it through maturity. You've got to do it through understanding. You've got to do it through knowledge and wisdom. And you might actually convince someone to believe. I've convinced people to believe what I believe and found out I was wrong later. Then I had to deal with the people I convinced I was right, and they became a problem. And I became their problem. When you've done this and pastored one church over 20 years, you can't hide much. Right? So the law of Christ, what is this? This is our united ethic. Uh, this is our united uh, ethic. Ethics. This is what ethically binds us together, the law of Christ. 
And what is it? Galatians gives another point of view. Carry, everybody say carry. Carry each other's burdens. So if I'm going to live by the law of Christ to love others as Christ has loved me and to keep unity, then that means I need to understand their pain. I need to understand their fears. I need to understand their addictions. I need to understand why they said what they said and why they do what they do. I got to come to a place what? When I begin to understand, I begin to load their burden on my back and I begin to carry it with them. So the law of Christ, what? It's to love in this way, love the world, love in a way that the world will recognize us, what? As his disciples. And if you will always meet people as Ted's trying to solve their problem, but if you will connect and understand their problem, and even if you can't fix it, you take some of that on you and fill it with them. That'll do more for them than either. There's times when my boys, sometimes it's like they just want to sit and not talk. Something going on in their life, and I'll be with them, you know, and stuff. So you, you need to go talk to them about that. And I'm, okay, I'll go talk to them. And I'm, you know, a guy, so I look, hmm, hey, bud, hey, yeah. I'm going to sit there for a long, hug it, love you, dad, love you, dad. And there's other times I talk. Well, I got to discern what they're carrying. A lot of times we're carrying things and we know the answer. We just need somebody to love us and not judge us. Carrying means I understand I'm taking the load. And in what? This way. In this way. The way that I understand your burden. The way that I understand the weight you're carrying. The way that I understand what you've been through, what you're going through, and what you're fearful that you will go through or might go through. That is carrying your burden burden. Jesus said, take on my yoke, for its burden is light and easy. When we yoke up together, we shouldn't put more pressure on one another. We should lighten one another's load. And if I'm in any relationship, even if I believe I'm right, and I'm the one putting the weight on it, I need to repent. You mean, they lied on me, why should I forgive them? Because it's the right thing to do. They did that to me. Why should I be nice to them? Because that's the law of Christ. He loved me when I didn't deserve to be loved. He understood me when I didn't understand myself. He carries my load today like he did even when I first gave my life to him and he will in the future. Why? Because that's his law. Not the Torah. That's done. That's fulfilled. But the law of Christ. Let's go to the next slide. So when we look at the law of Christ, here's the key, guys, and here's part two. So the first part is the law of Christ I've been trying to get in your spirit. This would be a template for you to make decisions. The second component is an informed conscience. An informed conscience. So when I began to look at this as an informed conscience, I got to realize however I inform my conscience, my conscience is how I'm hardwired, right? Right? It's not just Bluetooth, it's a hard wire. It's how I operate. It's how the decisions I make are made because of what I think. And what I think is made, the decisions are made is because of what I input into my mind, how I'm informed. If all you ever do is hang out with people that are just like you, you're not very informed. If all you ever do is hang out with people that vote like you, you're not very informed. If all you ever do is have a conversation with people that, ha- that agree on the same things you agree on, you're not, but I just can't because it upsets me, Pastor. Well, then you're not mature. Now you see why the scaredy cat stayed home today. Tennis is down 20% today because I'm talking about politics. That's okay. You'll get the word out to it. What, what are you saying, Preacher. Information is the key, guys. That means information. That's what information I allow to come into me. It's my hardware. And what is it? So that we do something. That we, so, so what is it? 
When I'm hardwired right, when I'm living by the law of Christ, and that's before anyone, anything, any person, any political party, any religion, any church, any doctor, when I'm living the law of Christ first to love others as I am loved by Christ, what? I'm hardwired with an informed conscience. What's that mean? Anytime I'm disturbed by something, irritated by something, or convicted by something that doesn't line up with this law, well, I just told them. You did. What'd you tell them? Well, they're stupid for voting the way they vote and believe in my God. How could they believe that? That's the stupidest thing. I, whoa. Shh, dummy, be quiet. See, see this little hardwire you got going on here? You're disturbed and irritated, but you're not convicted. It shouldn't be convicted to convince someone to do what I want them to do, to believe what I want them to believe, to ha behave the way I want them to behave, or to agree with me. It should be convicted that anything I do, I say, interrupts the law of Christ. You know, the, the little band that went around for years, it, it was a good thing. What would Jesus do, right? And it really, that is the law of Christ. What would Jesus do? Is that the way he would communicate what he believes? Is that the way that, that, that he would talk to someone? Is that the way he would talk about someone to someone else? Quiet in the Holy Ghost house. So anything that serves you, what happens? Anytime that happens collectively or as an individual. So there are certain things that happen. Let me set this up. We're getting there. There are certain things... That should convict you. There are certain things that should agitate you. There are certain things that should irritate you and even get you angry a little bit. What is that? Anything that comes against the law of Christ, right? So I'm going to give you a couple examples of how things over the years uh, happen, uh, happen with this. When we look at this, uh, I'll give you two examples, okay? Okay. And the key word here is self-evidence. It was, there's something that was self-evident I'm going to share with you. What self-evident means? That means it's like, duh, everybody knows that. Uh, sure, I mean, that's duh. Jesus is Lord, yes. Even people who are not Christians agree Jesus is Lord. You know, most people do in America. But there's certain things, you know, that's black. Okay, yeah, duh, it's black. It's, why is it black? It's always, that's what we've always called that color, right? Since we've been in kindergarten, they've called that color black, right? So what is it? Now that that monitor's there and its color is what? Self-evident. But what if a policy in school systems change and they didn't tell us older folks and they started teaching our kids in kindergarten that's blue? And 10 years later, you're arguing with your 10-year-old, that's black! Duh, Dad, that's blue. Well, it's self-evident to you it's black, but it's self-evident to them it's blue because of how they were informed. So let's take it a step further. It was self-evident at this time for this. This will blow you away. It was self-evident at some point people owned and controlled other people. As a matter of fact, slavery was in every community, every farm, every city, every kingdom on the earth. Some form of slavery existed. And Aristotle, the great philosopher, and the philosopher is what? A person who's supposed to tell us what we should think about the world. And they know what they know to that point, And they tell you from their understanding. Now, Aristotle gave us a lot of great truths, but this is a stupid one. To us now, it's not self-evident. But to him, he said it was self-evident that some should rule and others be ruled is a thing not only is necessary, but expedient. From the hour of their birth, some are marked out for subjection for others to rule. Now, does that mean he was cruel or anything else? No, what that means was that's the information he had that was self-evident. 
In other words, he wasn't going to try to connect. He wasn't going to try to make things different. He was going to take the things around the world and explain them and connect them for you. So the reason, it's just, let's don't even debate it. That's the way God made us and that's the way some rule and some don't. It was to him self-evident. But now check this out because let me, everybody say understanding. Okay. Now, in 4th century B.C., when Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, said this and made this statement, then in 4th century A.D. later on, in, when Christianity really began to take off, Christianity began to take hold of the Roman Empire at this time, and St. Augustine, a great preacher, right, of the gospel and, 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 and saint of God, made this statement. He said, the next slide, is that it? No, the one before that, I'm sorry. I got your head here. It was self-evident, well, it was self-evident to him, I don't think I have a slide on it. It was self-evident to St. Augustine, he said, no, slavery is a result of sin, it's not expedient, and it's not a part of nature. So see the difference? One operated based on what was self-evident to him, but years later, as a collective group of believers following by the rule of Christ began to change their mind and the way they treated people and what they thought, they began to be more dominant in the Roman Empire and they turned around what people believed that was just self-evident and they said, no, it's self-evident that to impose slavery is sin. How many agree with that? I would agree with that. That's a good one, right? So, so what are you saying, Pastor? It's all about understanding. And it's about following the rule of God and following his laws and not man. So here's another one for you. Uh, it was self-evident uh, in this, this particular time period that infanticide is good for society. So at one point in time, the Roman world, it was self-evident that fantasied exposure is good for society. So in fact, there were certain parts of the Roman area and territories that it was legal that, and actually required that if your wife had a child and you thought it was not yours, you and your family, you and your wife were supposed to take that child outside the city limits into the forest and set it somewhere. And if that infant made it and lived, it was its own fate. If it didn't, that meant its fate, it wasn't supposed to be here because it came a wrong way. Or if they had a birth defect or any other reason. Or if they hadn't had a boy yet and already had a girl, well, then just keep taking the girls out until you get a boy. But see, during that time, it was legal. During that time, look, it was self-evident. Why? Because it had always been that way. Because of a lack of understanding. And what I want you to get out of this, guys, is when Christians came along, Christians would come along during this time of infanticide, and they would go out and be very poor. And any time they'd see a child, they'd pick it up and bring it and raise it as their own. Why? Because to them, it wasn't a definite, right? To them, it just wasn't something that has always been and the way it should be. Now, they were ruled by the law of Christ. I should love that child as Christ loved me. How could I leave that child by the river to die, to be eaten by an animal or beast or starve to death when God's given me at least a roof and enough food to share to get them up and nurse them and help along the way? To them, Christ's law was self-evident not what was going on in the country and political. There's things that are very self-evident to certain people in this room that are really not correct. There's things I believe that are self-evident that I'm sure are not always correct, right? We all live in that. So unless we get understanding, we won't know any different or know how to handle ourselves any differently. Is this helping anyone? So later on, the Emperor Constantine, he declared infanticide a crime. He's a Christian, right? In the year 318 B.C., after, I mean A.C., uh, after uh, 
AD, after that, in 318, after Christianity had begun to take hold, the Emperor Constantine declared infanticide a crime. Why? Because it became a collective conscious of a group of people that determined what was right according to the law of Christ. So what I want you to realize is, is that you and I, our will is to keep unity, but it's also that unity is all based on the law of Christ to love someone else. Ask not I love them or mama love them or their mom loves them, but love someone else as Christ loved me. So why did it become a conscious issue? Because of the teachings of Jesus. Hundreds of years late, earlier, the teaching of Jesus had kept growing and growing and increasing until it dominated the culture and they changed what was self-evident and made it illegal that even if you left your child out, if you left your child out and their life was taken, your life was taken. So it was no longer self-evident, it was a crime. So the Emperor Val Valentinian uh, made exposure a capital offense later. He, he increased it. So let's look at this for a second. Let's go to the law of Christ. <clears throat> so I hit with you the law of Christ, what? To be loved, what? As Christ loved me. So I'm to love others, what? As Christ loved me. To have an informed conscience. What is an informed conscience? An informed conscience is informed not about your political view, not about where you came from and what you think or what you believe or, or, or what, how people treat you. Informed based on the law of Christ. Everything is weighed by how he loved us. We are to love others as he loved us. And if I have anything in my conscience that doesn't convict me, test me, disturb me when I'm doing something contrary to his law, then I'm on dangerous territory. And thirdly, we'll get into this now, knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge and wisdom. This is a famous quote, and I love this. This is from Rufus Miles. He was in the Kennedy and the Johnson administration and someone else's. And here's what he says. Where you stand depends on where you sit. Let that soak in. Where you stand depends on where you sit. This has to do with our knowledge and wisdom. So an informed conscience operates through knowledge and wisdom. We're not like animals, right? I've had a bunch of dogs in my life. We've had four dogs since we've been married. There was not one dog that we ever had that we got that just knew what to do. It's a fourth-generation Boston Terrier for us, so it should just know what to do. But it's different with human beings. Literature was written. Scrolls were written. Books were written. Education. So we have a big advantage over animals that came before us. Every generation passed on to the previous generation, to the next generation, what they had. They left it in writings and teachings and communication. So every generation is smarter than the previous generation. Every generation should be more intelligent than the previous <clears throat> generation, right? So where you stand depends on where you sit. Now, what does that have to do with? Our cultural context is sit. What is it? It determines our perspective, where we stand. So when we talk about that, where we sit, where we sit has to do with, uh, where we sit has to do really with where I was raised, how I was raised, what my family believed, where we, were we educated or not educated. So that point where you sit, where you came from, shaped the political views and values you have right now. What you've been told, what you've seen, what you've experienced, what we've seen from others' experience. All of that, what is that? That's where you Sit. So if you have a political stance today, it comes from what you've heard, it comes from what you've seen growing up, it comes from whether you're educated or not educated, in terms of whether you, you've learned, you've grown, you've studied, you understand, and where you stand today depends on where you sit. And this is where I wanted to get to with you. Until you know where a man sits, you'll never understand why he stands. 
And if you don't understand why he stands for what he stands for or she stands for what she stands for, you'll never have the understanding to convince them any other way. Yes. David Moles and I were talking. He said, man, Pastor, I think one of the reasons, you know, you, you just connect so much with the broken and the addicted is because you dealt with addiction and you went through that lifestyle. You went through that. Yeah, because to whom much is forgiven, much is required. You that's been through a divorce or you that's been through the loss of a loved one or the loss of a child or the loss of a parent, well, it gives you a higher maturity and qualification to carry a burden for someone because you know their pain, right? And until the reason you can reach different people is because you understand with a different kind of understanding. Your understanding is just not locked into one mode or one way. And I believe the reason we're a multicultural church and we're still surviving because the devil's done everything he could. It had him going to tear this place apart, to, to bury this place. They've said Bethel's been buried at least five times in 20 years. Really, seriously. And I mean, we were about buried a couple times. And it wasn't anything we had done like big sins or any of that stuff. But it was just the devil hates what you look around this room and see this morning. He hates a church where Democrats can worship together, Republicans can worship together, Independents can worship together, Holiness people can worship together, Baptist people can worship together. All different people from all different races, backgrounds, educational places can come and belong and be loved just as they are, not as we think they should be. So there's a lot of wisdom in that statement, in our, our mission statement, four Bs, right? It's a place where you belong where you love just as you are, right? Not as we think you should be. Place where you believe in Jesus and his rule, his word, his law, to love as you have been loved by him. A place where you become a disciple of Christ, a follower, a true follower that imitates Jesus. A place where you build the kingdom, a place where you make a difference. Our difference will only equal to the amount of our understanding. People who hit it big in business, some people get lucky every now and then, but they don't sustain it. But people who hit it and sustain in business have a different understanding than people that don't. You come to somebody and you're tired of financial stress and they've done well financially, what do you say? I've come to you because you're really good with finances. What are you saying? You have an understanding about money that I don't have, so I'm going to come to someone that has a higher understanding. And see, that's the way this thing works in our lives. And what I'm coming to you and challenging you with, here's what I'm challenging you with today, is whatever your perspective is, just put it on hold, right? Just put it on hold and just love people just the way they are. Just love them just the way they are. Vote, do what you need to do. I don't care. Go work for a campaign. Go knock on doors. Do whatever you want, but do it in love. And don't do anything that would disappoint Jesus. Don't attack people. Don't talk about people. Just don't be an idiot. It's real easy. Just don't be an idiot. You ever done that? Idiot, 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 idiot. I do that every so often. I just tell my, I'll get in my vehicle and go, you idiot, idiot. What'd you say? What'd you say? What'd you say? It's like Tommy Boy. So I'm like, it, 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 it. Dumb, dumb, dumb. Stupid is and stupid does. But if we don't have understanding and we're immature, we don't even realize we're stupid. There's nothing worse than a stupid person that doesn't know they're stupid and they're an extrovert. An extrovert stupid person <laughs> is the hardest for me to love. But I love them because that's the rule of Christ. I have to. But you know what I'm saying? It's the quite stupid people that really make me nervous. It's the, you know, anyway. They're evaluating you for days, weeks, months, or years, and they come to a big conclusion and just change everything because they never shared anything with you to understand you. I've had people leave this church, leave our staff, that had a misunderstanding of what I really thought or believed because they wouldn't come to me with it. And I couldn't help them with that. Or... I was still growing. I know it was a shock. They're growing too. They didn't understand. I still need to grow in my understanding in the area. Instead of helping me with that, just judge it, cut it, and go. Just, I'm not even asking if it's helping you. I think it is. 
So where you stand is where you sit. Always remember that, guys. When you're dealing with someone and you're in conflict, just stop. Take a deep breath. Pause and try to understand. That doesn't make it what they really believe is self-evident and it's wrong that you just have to say, I agree with what's wrong. It just means you agree to listen to them and to be kind to them. And you know what? They might want to listen to you after that. I know it may shock you. So political views and values are shaped by all these things, right? Where we live, how we're raised, and all that as we wrap up here. Um, so the law of Christ, the next slide, yeah, there's the law of Christ, informed conscience, knowledge and wisdom, and we just hit policy and platform to an extent, legislation. That all comes from the things I told you. So let's wrap up here. Here's, here's a few things I want you to do. They all begin with L, and then we're going to pray. Here's the way forward. Here's the way I believe we need to do this. Number one, we need to listen to people who have experienced the world in a different way than you. Listen to people that, it's easy to listen to people that agree with you, right? Or they're where you want to go or be. But listen to people who don't experience. You see, I didn't say believe because you know what you believe, what you've experienced. You say, well, why do you have such faith for people to be healed of cancer? Because I prayed for quite a few people that got healed of cancer. I prayed for a lot that didn't, but I prayed for enough to know that God heals cancer. Well, well why do you believe in prosperity? Because I know I've seen God prosper, and I know how he prospers. I've experienced it, and I've seen others experience it from nothing. Well, it's an experience. So you really believe what you experience. That's your understanding. Secondly, so we want to listen. The second thing we do is learn. Listen to people who don't experience the, what, the world the way you do, and then what? Learn. Be a student, not just a critic. If you're just sitting there thinking of ways to punch into what, holes in what they're saying, you'll never accomplish anything. Listen to people that have a different experience than you. Listen, white people in politics, white people, you know what you fear? What might happen? You know what brown and black people fear? What has happened, and not that long ago. <laughs> so we all deal with fear here, people. What we need to do is understand and love one another and carry one another's burdens and put the love of Christ first and love people just as he's loved us. And I know he's loved some dark spots in my life, and I still deal with stuff like you. And he loves me just as I am. So be a student. Don't just be a critic. Why? Because they're taking a stand based on where they sit. They're taking a stand based on. So if you want to find out why, why do they believe what they believe, then go find out what they experience. Listen to them. Let them tell you where they sat, where they sit. They sit from what they've experienced, just like you sit from what you have experienced. And then finally, this one, love. Love. Love the you beside you is more precious to God than your potentially uh, political view or flawed view. The person sitting on the left of you or the right of you is more important to God than your point of view. That's why I said, don't ever allow your view, your opinion to ruin a relationship. Because I promise you, your political view will be tweaked and there'll be things changed as you mature and get more understanding or you thought somebody was going to do something and they didn't and you supported it. And then later on, you're like, I lost a friendship, I became an idiot, and I got this stupid political candidate. I've been there, done it. I know. What you got to realize is love is the first thing. The you beside you is more precious to God than your potentially flawed view. That doesn't mean you can't share your view, but you can never share your view till you understand someone else's view. If you do, you're just wasting your time. Unless they come to you and want to hear your view. So love builds the bridge. So if you don't agree with someone and they don't show you love and they're burning their side of the bridge, what are you going to do? Just show them and burn your side of the bridge? And it happens. But if you will love even people burning their side of the bridge, you can get kind of close to them and understand them and love them. Who knows? Maybe help build the bridge of that relationship again. So here's the key. 
that we take away from this, and this is the last Sunday I'm preaching on it. I'll probably preach on it again this summer when you're all heated up and fired up real good, about ready to be an idiot. Right as you're getting ready to be stupid, I'm going to preach part three. I'm going to wait. I'll discern it. I hope it's more than a month away. I hope it's in the summer at least. <laughs> you think I'm kidding, but I've done this a long time. And I love you because I, Stephanie could tell you I, I'm stupid about five times a week, so she knows. <laughs> Disagree politically. Love unconditionally and pray for unity. Let's stand. What could God do with a church that could do that? What could God do with a church that could disagree politically, love unconditionally, and pray for unity? What could God do with a church that does that in their community? That builds bridges instead of burning bridges. That doesn't mean you change where you sit. It just means you understand where someone else stands. You know, you, you go home for Thanksgiving or Christmas or there's something you dread. Somebody in your family has a different political view. Oh, Lord, we're going to go around and around. Well, that's a great Christian view. Is that what Jesus would do? Yeah, but sometimes Jesus took a whip and did this and that. Well, you better know you're right. He knew he was right. And it turned out good. But if you don't know, you're, he didn't do that in every temple. They did that in every temple. But he did it in that temple. So you need to take the context of Jesus. Because remember, you can take anything, you can take a lot of things Jesus said and make him red or make him blue or make him independent. You can do it. It's easy. But the key is, are you right or wrong? Begin to think about and pray about why you sit where you sit. Some things you hadn't thought about in years, you just need to open up to it. But the main thing, other than knowing where you sit, is understanding where someone stands because of where they sit. Pray for understanding. Pray for knowledge. Pray for grace. Grace to love people. Grace to forgive people. Be a unifier. Man, you see your friends going at it, destroying each other on Facebook, 15-year relationships, 20-year relationships, just being blown up. Some family members destroying one another over politics. And after this year, in four more years, there'll be another one. In four more years, there'll be another one. But your family, you get one time. Your neighbor, you get one time. What are we doing? Who do we think we are? Who do we think we are that we have a right to discredit and tear someone else down because we don't stand where they stand because we sit in different places? Who are we? If you get to heaven, you might ask God. Because with that opinion, you may not. Or you just get there stupid. Because you can get there stupid. Just get there by believing that he's his blood and get saved and just mess everybody up on the way and get there. But you know, there's a thing called the white throne judgment where everything you do and done will be evaluated and determine your ranking in the kingdom of heaven. And that's forever. I want you to bow your heads and think about someone right now. Maybe you didn't say anything to them, but every time their name comes up, you're mad or angry because they posted or said something you didn't agree with. Or you know something about them. They agree with something you don't agree with. Just get their face in front of you right now. Because you know what? If you were on your deathbed right now, that's the faces that come up. The family you've neglected, the people you've hurt. That's what comes up at every deathbed, my friend. And 85% of you in this room, including me, that if the rapture doesn't come before we die, we will die on a deathbed somewhere. Less than 15% of people die, and all really 10%, I think it is, die in car accidents, plane accidents, disease, whatever. 90% of us are going to die, 88 or 89% are going to die on a deathbed somewhere. And let me tell you something, your deathbed experience will not be, I was right, I knew we should have voted for that one. 
I was right. I knew she shouldn't have married him. It's going to be, even if you were right, if you did it the wrong way, you'll be convicted. I've had people write letters, calls. Man, I forgave you, brother. I'll come meet you right now. I forgave you when you did it. I've seen family members cry and parents not even pass away until their child would finally come to the hospital where they could ask for forgiveness. And then they just pass. Don't be that way, man. Oh, pastor, you're just making a big old deal out of this. This is fun. If it's fun for you, I'm concerned with your salvation. I'm just telling you that. If this mess that's going on in our country is fun for you, ma'am, or fun for you, sir, if I... I can't say you're not saved, but I doubt you're saved. Or you're very stupid. Just a dumb Christian. I can't believe a preacher called me stupid. Well, if it's you, it's you. If you're not stupid, don't take offense to it. It wasn't you. I told you I'm stupid too a lot of times in my life. But what I want you to realize, guys, you say, why are you so strong, Pastor? Why are you using such harsh words? It's Sunday. We showed up. The scaredy cats didn't. Because I love you so much. I don't want you on your deathbed regretting. I, I don't want you sitting at a funeral home regretting something you've never said or you've never done. I don't want you not being invited to a wedding, not being invited to a party, a birthday party or something because of where you stand and not understanding where someone else sits. Now is the time to deal with it. Now is the time to let it go. We're going to pray. And I want you to forgive people that are not like you. Forgive people that to you are just stupid. It's self-evident they're just dumb, right? And I mean, there's some of you in this room, it's self-evident to you that I'm dumb. That's okay. That's what you understand of what I understand we may find out maybe I am done but Christ isn't and if we operate by his law to love each other as he loved us and if we do his will in John 17 which is to keep unity among us we'll be okay